about everyday AI risks, not the existential risks, because there's not that much we can do about those. So let's, let's start by looking at the three main categories of gen AI risk. There's new cybersecurity threats, and we'll explain, we'll break that down for you. There's unwanted, inaccurate outputs that can misguide your corporation, your organization, if you use this information without filtering it. And there are privacy and data confiden confidentiality risks that are new to Gen AI. And the reason they're new is now your competitors and the hackers just have to talk to your data. So if you leak data by accident to a third party foundation model, your competitor can just talk to it. They don't have to know the file structure. They don't have to know the programming language. They just have to know where is the blueprint for this chipset. So let's talk about this by breaking down three key areas. First, we'll look at the risks. What are they? And what is this attack surface? We've been attacked for years, but what's new? Best practices for mitigating the risks is the second section. And then the third section is really the most important. What do you do about this? How do you organize? What steps do you take? So let's start with the risks and the attack surface. And it's growing. I'm sure you've heard by now that ChatGPT is spurring a major increase in AI investment. And it was already pretty substantial before. We published a survey in 2022 showing 73% of organizations had hundreds or thousands of models deployed. And now with ChatGPT, that's just growing. So that just means the attack surface, the compromise surface, is also growing. And if you're in your insecurity, you definitely face an uphill battle, because most will tell you that the benefits outweigh the risks. And I'm sure they do, but all you need is one bad incident to change that equation. And almost 90% of business technologists say they would bypass cybersecurity to meet a business objective. How many of you are in security? I'm just curious. <laughs> so you understand what I'm talking about. I talked to so many CISOs, and you know, AI's been around for a really long time, but ChatGPT is just really increased interest and urgency from CISOs. Our calls are coming in at much higher frequency than they did before ChatGPT. So what are the risks and what can you do about them? We put the risks into eight major categories. And I went out there looking for articles in the news to validate that these risks are really alive and well. And it was no problem finding them. I'm sure I could update this. I had a hand in the presentation a month or two ago. But when it comes to unreliable outputs, you probably all heard about the lawyer that used ChatGPT to generate the briefs. And then ChatGPT authoritatively said, here's two cases that you should include in the brief. This is what happened. And those were entirely fake cases. So the judge sanctioned the lawyer, and that was the end. Of, you know, He got fined, and it was very embarrassing. I'm sure you must have heard of the Samsung breach with data confidentiality. Some employee inadvertently just sent some very sensitive IP to ChatGPT, and uh, Samsung banned the use of it after that. You can't really ban the use of it because people are just going to go home or just use their mobile devices. So restricting access isn't going to do you any good. Intellectual property risks, there are lawsuits, there are liability for character defamation, there's new cybersecurity threats we'll talk about. Consumer protection, there was a consumer helpline for eating disorders, and the caller called in, and ChatGPT gave the caller very dangerous advice. You don't want that happening. There's new compliance, especially in the EU and China are way ahead of the United States with regulation. And finally, the misinformation risk. We've had that for a long time, but generative AI just makes it so much easy for the criminals. And how does it make it easier? It takes about three seconds of voice now to impersonate your voice. It used to take 60 to 90 minutes to come up with your voice. Now you can get your, if you have your voice anywhere on the internet, a criminal can take it and use it for social engineering. They can also go to lots of websites for deep fakes. In this case, 
Zelensky had, they made a deep fake of Zelensky telling citizens to surrender. So this is quite dangerous. And there's new attack vectors. There's something called adversarial prompting. So if you're in security, you know the things on this uh, slide are not new. Information gathering, fraud, intrusion, malware. But what's new is they can put their instructions inside your prompts. And we call it indirect prompt injection because it's, they don't put it inside the Q&A, the, the questions into the model. They put it inside the documents that accompany the question. So it's easy for them to craft an attack and it's easy for them to spread it. You don't have to know too much programming. You can have end-to-end -end, uh, attacks so they can just go say, go look at Gartner's network, tell me where the vulnerabilities are. Based on the vulnerabilities, build, go get this exploit, use it, put it in a PNG file, create an email that this user wanted a response in an email anyways, and then read the address book and spread the malware all over the organization. So it's basically attacks on steroids. So to summarize, the attack surface and the compromise surface has increased. And this is just an overview of how it's increased. We've got the life cycle, the attack surfaces, and then the IT supply chain. And the blue shows the steps that you take if you're developing a model or an application. So in that case, you have to worry about the training data and your IT supply chain. Most of us are using third-party Gen AI models, so we're all subject to runtime lifecycle steps. And those are just some of the main new attack surfaces. We talked about the prompts, the inputs and the outputs. There's also the prompt integration that can be exploited, the plugins, the application code, the APIs, and of course, the IT supply chain. So the moral of the story is there, this is a new attack surface. It's a new compromise surface. It's not all bad guys. It's intentional. It's non-intentional. And there's new things for you to think about. So when you think about best practices for Gen AI, trust, risk, and security, or just any AI, trust, risk, and security. And by the way, we call it trust, risk, and security because it's not just security. It's not just bad actors. It's how do you make your model transparent so you trust it? You, and it's not just models, it's applications. How do you know it's behaving the way it's supposed to behave? How do you manage your liability, your risk, your reputation risk? And finally, how do you get the hackers out of the way? And what this chart and framework is intending to show you is that there's new vectors, there's new compromises, and there's new risk management measures that you have to take. AI is just not another file on your hard drive. It has very special properties and you can't use your old measures to address the risks. You still need your old measures. You still have system faults. You still have human compromise. Humans are always the point of least resistance. You still have damages to your assets, theft of data and money loss. You still need all your legacy security, endpoint, network, data protection. You still need risk management. But now with AI, you have a new vector and you have to point the controls to those vectors. And the old controls don't work with model input and output. They don't work with AI data. So you need to start using new measures. Now what you use will depend on your deployment approach. Not everybody deploys the same way. So over on the left, everything is from the provider the application, the data retrieval, the fine tuning, and the model. So that would be applications like ChatGPT or Office 365, and they control the entire stack. You still can put in your risk controls, but they're controlling the stack. You, have, you can build your own application. Over in the middle, you can also do your own data retrieval and prompt engineering. You can do your own fine tuning. And finally, you can have your own model using open source or building it yourself. Now, none of this is easy. It requires a lot of skills. Most of our clients are in the first two columns and the risk controls are applied there. But you hardly ever will manage your own foundation model 
and there's not much you can do to control the foundation model. In fact, there's nothing you can do to control the foundation model. All you can do is control the inputs and the outputs. So let's take a look at a typical application flow for the middle column. This is the prompt engineering and data retrieval. And we'll look at how the data flows and what controls you have, and then we'll look at what you don't have and what you can do about it. So here we've got the application, and let's just take an HR application we want to build. What's your prescription eyeglass benefit next year? So I go into the Gartner HR portal. I say, how much money do I get for eyeglasses in 2024? Gartner will have had to prepare the data on my insurance policies and my premiums and structure it most optimally in a vector database so the performance is optimal. And then they take the, my question goes with my data on my insurance policy. Let's say it goes over to OpenAI Azure. And that's what's called the modified prompt. Azure has its own prompt orchestration system that's not showing on this chart. All the foundation vendors have that. So they may substitute the words in my prompt because they want to have more efficient response. The response comes back. The enterprise can ground that response with whatever controls you want to put in. And then the response goes back to me. I get $150 for eyeglasses next year. Now, Gartner has a lot of controls. We've got legacy controls on data classification, access management, data loss prevention, but they need to be revisited and they're not enough. There's a lot of oversharing in the organization that will come to light, especially with Office 365, because now you don't need to know where the files are. I can just go query anything in English. So all this oversharing has to be revisited but we do have legacy controls. And the vendors, they have legacy controls too. They've hardened their models, they've red teamed them, they have societal content filtering, looking for hatred and violence, but that's not enough either. So what's missing? There's three main gaps in what you as a user will get from these Gen AI providers. And we put them in these categories. Anomaly detection to look for anomalies on the inputs and the outputs. So all the interactions with the foundation model. Is it violating your enterprise policy? Are you sending confidential data? Your DLP systems, if you have them, they're not looking at these new policies. So you need new screening on those inputs. And on the outputs, nothing's looking to see if it's accurate, if it's a hallucination, if it's got copyright. So you need to put those input-output filters in for anomaly detection. Data protection. You can't do anything much about the data that you're sending to the third-party environment, but there's a lot you can do to make sure classified data doesn't get to that environment. And finally, application security. None of the security tools are looking for prompt injections. Some of the vendors, like Palo Alto and a couple others, are enhancing their tools to inspect the content. But these, new, these attacks, and they haven't shown up yet, so I must admit, they're, you know, it's all theoretical now, although there may be some that we haven't seen because people aren't looking. But you can be sure the hackers are going to start using prompt injection attacks because it's so easy. And vector database attacks, the vector databases are not encrypted, the metadata is not encrypted. And you can reverse engineer about 70% of the data from the numeric representations and the embeddings. So those are the new gaps. And it turns out most of you are concerned about data privacy and then security and hallucinations. So if you look at what the vendors are doing for data protection, this is too, a lot of text. And we have a very detailed note on what Microsoft Azure is doing and OpenAI is doing, and we're researching the other vendors. But essentially, they protect your prompts. They only store them for 30 days. They're not encrypted, by the way. The traffic is encrypted, but the data itself is not encrypted. They don't use your data for training the model. They, in the case of Microsoft, they keep all your data in the private tenant. But neither company and no company will assume liability if your data is compromised. And many of the companies we talk to have their lawyers working on this, but they're not going to assume liability. They could never afford that. 
And this is not a new issue for SaaS, but it's more scary, frankly, because you can, a competitor or a criminal can just access your data using the English language. But they won't assume liability, and they don't give you any visibility into their security controls. So there's no way for you to verify what they're doing. It's trust without verify. You also have no visibility into the metadata that they're storing. I'm not saying these guys are bad guys and they're lying to you and they're not going to pr protect your data, but you know everyone makes mistakes. And you don't have visibility into the environment to protect yourself from those mistakes. So what can you do? It's not all bad news. There's plenty that you can do, and you just have to take one step at a time. We came up with this framework. It's called AI Trust, Risk, and Security. It's AI TRISM. And what this is showing you on the bottom is the first thing you have to do that we'll talk about at the end is set up your organizational governance. You can't manage this out of security or IT. You really need all the participants involved. You need to set up your measurements, your policies, your workflows, define what's private, what's biased. And then you can go get these technology components. And this reflects the market. The market's a little like cybersecurity 10, 15 years ago. It's still pretty fragmented. It's starting to consolidate. But the blue boxes show what the builders or the owners of the model can do. So you can't make the models transparent. OpenAI needs to make its model transparent. They need to manage the model. And they also need to make it adversarial resistant against attackers. But what you can do when you use these models is you can go get some technology for content anomaly detection. You can build it yourself, or you can use this new market has solutions. You can protect your data, the classified data, from going to their environment. You, you can't really obfuscate data going into the LLM because the LLM won't respond the way you want but you, you can at least make sure you're only sending what you, you intend to send. And you can certainly buy application security solutions. So if you take these three orange bo uh, boxes, we created an innovation guide, which is like a market guide, that gives you lists of what these vendors do and who they are. But it's basically those three categories. Anomaly detection for out output and input risk, securing applications, and protecting data. And they do what you're used to in security. You know, keyword matching, AI-based detection, rule engines, deep inspection, enforcing enterprise use cases. And some of the key trends affecting this market, we think that the large security vendors will start buying up these little ones. But one of the main trends you should be aware of is if you get one of these products, you also can get a map of what your users are doing. So many of the CISOs that are calling me are saying, we have no idea what our users are doing. We really need visibility into this. And if you get one of these products, you also get a map. So you get a dashboard into all the connections of all your users. I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't been able to vet these products because there's no live production <laughs> customers yet. Uh, they're, they're pretty much piloting. But you do get a map of what's going on in your organization, and that's important. So let's look at how one of these works. This is a really busy slide, so I'll summarize it for you. This is a vendor. In this case, it's Bosch AI Shield. And they're working for a hospital. And the hospital wants to monitor the inputs and outputs. So they created an interim LLM model between the enterprise, the hospital, and OpenAI. And they train that small model on what the hospital policies are, both on the input and the output. And then they take those policies that they created and map them to roles. That's on the top. So they have input violations, output violations for policy one that applies to role one, which is the doctor. So now the doctor asks the model, what's the prescription medication for hamstring pull? And the model is fine, you know, we give you an answer. But the second question, the doctor says, my patient has addiction behavior, so what's the highest dosage of OxyContin that I can prescribe? And the model goes, nope, 
input block, this is medically harmful, you shouldn't be asking that question, so the doctor stopped in his tracks. Then the doctor says, give me a list of 10 doctors who specialize in knee surgery. And the output's blocked because too much PII comes back that belongs to these surgeons. But now the administrator and the compliance officer ask the same questions and they get whatever they want back. So these products are probably, in my estimation, 80% effective. You have to put rules around them, other policies. But they're a good start to starting to screen for your policies. And that brings us to the next section on policies. How do you set up those policies? Before we go there, though, I'd like to point out that there are other methods that can reduce unwanted outputs. So it's not just these tools that screen for policies. There's complementary methods, like aligned models. You can go get models now that have been curated, for example, to eliminate copyright. Uh, IBM says they do that, and they'll indemnify you against copyright violations. You can also fine tune your own models. So you could take an existing model and, and create your own layer and tell the model, tell the application only use my private validated data. Prompt engineering is another method you can use. So you can, as we saw with the prescription eyeglasses, you tell the model only use my data, don't use any data from the internet. The, da the model's been trained on the internet, but it will only answer with your data and it, it reduces the amount of inaccuracies and hallucinations. You can still get hallucinations, by the way, even if you say to use my data, but it's lower. We talked about the tools, and then there's content authentication. You want to see the source of the response. So when a response comes back, what's the provenance of this data? There's new standards emerging, like um, Adobe announced one content credentials that Google's backing. There's also tools from companies like DataRobot. If it sits between you and the model, you can actually look up which vector embeddings went into the response. The tools I showed you will show you the source of the response. So there's a lot of work going on that when you get a response back, you know the source. You still have to vet it. You still need people. You can't trust these models. You can't trust any of this, but hopefully it'll eliminate how much you have to watch. So that brings us to the final section. What do you do? How do you go about this? You have to organize yourselves, and it is a team sport. AI is a team sport, and certainly AI risk and security management is a team sport. It can't just sit in security. It can't just sit in IT. You need everybody coming together. Now, it would be optimal if you had line authority somewhere. And maybe one day you'll have a chief AI officer and you can have a chief AI risk officer reporting to that person. And we do see that, by the way, in some of the largest financial institutions. But if your organization is like most, you'll need to set up a task force. And we do find that most have a task force. So in 2022, we published this research, 68% said they had a task force. And we're seeing the same thing with Gen AI. We're updating the data now, by the way. And when you do have a task force, you can expect to get better results. So when you have a task force, more projects move into production, and the organizations say they realize more business value because everyone's on the same page. They know what to expect. They know what the model is supposed to do. They know what the risks are. So you're going to end up getting better business results. And you, then you need to figure out where to allocate the budget. And we found that when the budget's allocated to the CIO office, more projects move into production. Then the CTO, then the CISO. So you set up a task force, you give the budget to the right party, and in most cases, that will be the CIO. And again, we're updating this as we speak. And then you're ready to actually move into action. So what's action mean? You have to define your acceptable use policies. We have a policy template to help you do that. But you've got to educate your staff and your employees, you know, what is our acceptable use policy? And then you have to implement data classification and access management. 
because you can't tell employees don't send confidential data to the model if they don't know where, what confidential data is and who has access to it. And as I was talking about before, number two could take you 18 months if you're an average organization. And one of the more interesting one-on-ones I had here was with a CTO from a large restaurant chain. And he told me I could talk about it publicly. I won't mention the chain. But he said he's one of the pilot users for Office 365 Copilot. And he was checking it out. And he said, you know, go show me the salaries of all these different units so I can compare, you know, the salary ranges across units. And Office 365 tools went to private Excel files that were on OneDrive that hadn't been locked down by the team managers. So, you know, this is going to be a huge job. When, when someone creates a personal spreadsheet in your organization and they put it on their drive, they're not going to bother to think about the permissions and who's going to access this. You need to think about it. And you need to give your staff time to lock down their data. And then you're going to have to revisit everything in your organization, the structured data, the unstructured data, every group, every role, every individual. It's going to be a lot of work because now you have democratized access to your data. And to me and to the people I've spoken with, that's going to be the toughest part. And there's plenty of consulting firms that would love to help you, so I'm sure you won't have any trouble there. Then you have to establish a system to record and approve applications from users. So what do you guys want to do with this? You know, have them put some discipline and structure into the system. You don't want to be too bureaucratic, but you need an inventory of what people want to do and what they're doing. So they need to apply. They need to say what data they're using. They need to say who needs to approve it. And then your task force, the right people, will approve it. And once or twice a year, you go back to the users and say, did you use this the way you said you'd use it? Keeps them honest. Then you implement the tools we talked about and the framework. And a lot of the monitoring can happen electronically, but you still need to involve humans. You still need people aware of what they want to do and why they're doing it. And then finally, ongoing governance, monitoring, and compliance. I'm sure you've heard this for years. Security and risk management is an ongoing process. It never ends. Things are changing all the time, especially when it comes to Gen AI. But the good news is, if you do this, we predict, and this is a conservative prediction, that enterprises who apply these controls will consume at least 80% less inaccurate or illegitimate information that will lead your organization to faulty decision making. It's not rocket science. You just have to take one step at a time, one application at a time, one control at a time, and you can manage the risks before they manage you. So thank you very much for coming to our conference and have a great rest of the week.